Okay, here we go. Welcome everybody to the water committee meeting. Today is the 25th of September. It is a little bit after two o'clock. We were uh, dealing with some IT issues, but uh, I'll call the roll. Uh, Dean Brady is here. Kim Dennehy is here. Myself, I'm John Hamrick, the chair of the committee. Ryan Stevens is also joining us today. Andrea Stein, Travis Payne, and Kathy Green. Yes. As a candidate for HD 60, I believe. Yes, and I thought I'd see what this, I mean, this affects everybody almost. Sure, and would you mind? Mike Smith, I'm here as a, a water user. And I'm also on the sanitation district board. The other end of the water. Yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, someone from Ralph Tellus, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. uh, Todd Christiano. And today we're going to be talking about the water rate study, I believe. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Payne? That is correct. All right. Why don't you uh, jump on in? Sure. So this is going to be a, um, a presentation of the draft of the water rate study as it as it stands so far. Um, uh, Ralph Tellis has a handful of slides that we're going to go through, and I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to him so he can provide the pertinent information. Let me uh, share my screen real quick. So I put a clicker in your computer there. Sure. All right, just let's drive. Okay. Sounds good to me. Me too. Very good computer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, my name is Todd Cristiano. I'm with Raftelis Financial Consultants. Uh, we're a nationwide uh, consulting firm. We focus on um, working with water and wastewater utilities and sanitation districts like the city of Canyon City. This is kind of our bread and butter. Um, I've uh, been uh, as a consultant for 25 years. Our firm has been around since 1993. Like I said, we do work nationwide. So uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I've got a slide deck here uh, to talk about um, what we were hired to do and present some preliminary results to you about the financial status of the utility. More importantly, what needs to be done to maintain the financial health of the utility today through our study period, which is a 10 year look ahead. But um, even beyond that, just because when you build water infrastructure, it takes a long time to construct and design, and then it lasts a really long time. So although we're looking at 10 years, uh, a lot of the infrastructure gets built last 20, 30, 40 years. So um, setting up the first 10 and getting you ready for the next 20 and 30 um, is what our plan is. So because I've got a few slides here, we're gonna dive into a little bit of details on the financial plan. Travis will be able to fill in the blanks in terms of the detail about the capital improvement program, which is obviously a huge driver for the revenue adjustments over the next 10 years. So hopefully not leaving on the spot there. There we go. Um, so we're going to talk about the study goals and objectives, what, what we're trying to accomplish here. Talk about the rate study process. How do we go about developing a financial plan and developing the rates that we charge customers? Um, we'll look at the draft financial plan scenarios. There are two of them. And then, uh, although we don't, haven't gotten com fully complete through the study, I do have a survey that shows where the city um, compares with other utilities around the area in terms of a typical residential bill and where that might go to uh, once we complete the study. So it just kind of sets the stage for where we are today. Uh, obviously, the rates and fees the city charges needs to fund operations, we need to fund our capital projects, we need to maintain our reserves or that minimum level of money in the bank um, each year, we need to fund our growth and, and that sort of thing. And we have to ensure our cost recovery. We want to make sure that the rates we're charging our customers are recovering the costs to do business. And so we're going to do that by evaluating these four areas, a financial plan, our cost of service, I'll talk about what that is here in a minute, uh, rate design, and, and our tap fees. And I'll talk about each one of those here next. So the four components of our study and our Four components of a study, rate study, and this study are a financial plan that tells us how much money does a utility need on an annual basis to maintain operations and maintain that level of service that customers expect and are accustomed to. 
the cost of service, is everyone paying a fair share? If you look around the customers, the different types of customers you have within the system, you have residential customers, you have commercial customers, uh, irrigation, city parks, and things like that. Are those groups of customers paying their fair share for how they use the system? That's what the cost of service analysis is gonna tell, uh, tell us. Um, rate design is how can we show our rates are fair? And we do that by looking at um, the cost service tells us how much, what's the cost to serve each of these different groups of customer classes, residential, commercial. The rate design tells us how are we going to get it. We can charge a flat charge of $100 per bill, and you can use as much water as you want. Well, that's great for the finance director. You're going to guarantee you're going to get your money. But in terms of water conservation and affordability, that may be a challenge. So when we look at our rate design, we're going to consider some of those objectives. Um, essential use affordability, revenue stability from the utility side, conservation, making sure that we're equitable between low volume users and high volume users and all those sorts of things. And some of those items can be measured quantitatively. Other ones are measured a little more qualitatively just based on what the community values are of, of the city. Lastly, rate design, I'm sorry, tax fees. Um, these are the one-time charges for new development. Um, and these are not for existing customers. So a new developer comes in, wants to put in a neighborhood, say, and they have 100 <laughs> lots they want to sell, but they need to pay a tax fee for each one of those lots. And what the role of that tax fee is to recover the cost of capacity needed to serve them. The water, the water plant has all this capacity to serve customers. And um, a new customer comes in, and I have to reserve their portion of capacity based on what their demands are going to be. One time charge. I liken it to um, joining a gym. You join a gym, you pay the initiation fee. It's a one time charge, gives you access to all the facilities. And then the monthly user charges are making sure the treadmill keeps running. So, uh, kind of a silly example, but um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty close to what it actually does. So, we had some other areas of focus here. As part of our financial planning, there's a couple ways we can fund projects, and one is through cash, or we can use debt, much like if you buy a car, you can fund it through cash, you can take out a loan. And there are some advantages to using loans um, versus funding versus cash and vice versa. There's the, obviously the interest rate risk, you pay more for the project over time because of interest, but at the same time, you're not having to build up a lot of cash to try to cash finance a project. So we, looked at, we have two scenarios we look at there. Uh, there's some zone, different pumping zones within the community here to, to get the water to customers. And we're looking at what do those zone pumping charges need to be? Because there's obviously a cost associated with running a pump, the electricity, among other things like repair and maintenance of those uh, facilities. And they're only really unique to a certain group of customers. We don't want to charge our other customers who don't need pumping to, to pay for that. So we're looking at those charges there. So I'm trying to go back and forth. Right. You can talk to them, that's fine. Um, and uh, equitable allocation of cost to city parks. One of the things that we're looking at too is that the city currently charges for city parks, but we're looking at the rate for that. And obviously city parks, you think about some probably mainly irrigation, they have different demand patterns than other customer classes. So we're gonna look at what's the appropriate rate to charge them to make sure that residential is not subsidizing city parks, <laughs> city parks isn't subsidizing commercial and all that good stuff. And uh, obviously, private fire protection lines. These are uh, the private fire lines that businesses would have uh, that would be used at, uh, in times of a fire. And uh, these are usually just fixed charges per month. They wouldn't affect residential. It would only be certain commercial customers that have private fire lines. So a, a few subset group of customers within the, uh, within the total customer base. So let's jump into financial planning. If you have any questions, please let me know because we're kind of we started out at 30,000 feet, we're going down to 5,000 feet. Um, how the financial planning process works, just like any sort of um, process, your budget at home or whether you own your own business, um, when we develop our financial planning process, we have to look at a number of things. Obviously, the revenues that come in, and that's rate revenues, that's tax fees, um, other operating revenues such as late fees, turn on, turn off fees for new customers, and tax fees and, and loan proceeds should we issue loans. And what's not on here is grants. Grants would be another item. You obviously have expenditures, operating expenses, that's salaries and wages, uh, materials, supplies, chemicals, utilities. And, memberships and uh, conference, conference attendance and all those sorts of things. And there's some transfers that we have uh, unique to the city for, um, to the general fund uh, for certain services, shared services that um, the city, the utility benefits from. But underneath all those revenues and expenditures are all under this umbrella of certain policies we need to maintain. 
And one is called reserve levels, and that is maintaining a certain level of money in the bank that you don't want to dip below, that if you have a, a crisis or uh, something that was not budgeted, some, some extreme expenditure that you could dip into this bank account and pull money out and not affect the budget, not have to call the customer and say, hey, we need an extra $10 from everybody. The other one's called covered ratios, and this has to do with debt. Uh, when we issue debt for a utility, there's a number of metrics you have to maintain, but the most important one is called debt service coverage ratio, which is essentially net income divided by debt service. It's the inverse of debt to income ratio when you buy your house, and you have to maintain a certain level. Otherwise, the bondholders get a little, get a little antsy. So those are two things we need to maintain. Now, the city has um, reserve policies already on um, um, on paper, so we didn't have to work with developing them. So there's been some reserve policies that have been around for some time. So those are kind of slated in stone. And the coverage ratios, we don't set those. They're set by the people issuing the loans. Uh, the state issues a lot of loans. We have some state loans here. And um, uh, the state has a certain debt service coverage requirement. So that's not something that we can change. And that gets to a multi year financial plan. Now, here's the thing is that we have multiple years and we have multiple capital projects. Some years it's a lot of capital projects, some years it's not. So what we're trying to do is find this balance of raising revenue, increasing the annual revenue you need to fund all these projects without uh, having rate shock, you say. So one year you have a 1% increase followed by a 30%. So we don't want to do that. Um, customers and people like smooth and predictable. They know it's going to be 3% a year. People could be comfortable with that. They know some sort of, you know, Eve and Steven over the next 10 years. But balancing that can be difficult too, uh, depending on how much cash you have in the bank versus the level of your capital project for that year and that sort of thing. So it's a delicate balance with the play this optimization game of it's kind of like whack ball in a way, trying to get everything balanced out. And uh, but that's what we've done for these two scenarios. We try to keep the revenue adjustments over the study period smooth and predictable as possible, not have that kind of herky jerky increases. So the way we're looking at this, so we have the financial plan, and if you've ever looked at the um, the financials from the annual report from the city, from the utility, um, they have a water fund and a water, raw water fund. And so for the purposes of this, we've separate, kept these separate as well. We have this one called the operating and capital cash fund. This fund just kind of captures the annual operations and the capital projects, things that need to be funded from rates and taxes. And this other fund here is a raw water cash flow. It kind of sits over here separate. It has its own sources and funds. And there are some monies that get, get transferred or are used from the rate revenues to fund this. But it's, it's relatively small in the grand scheme of things. So our focus was this operating cash flow fund. Um, and again, uh, that consists of the rate revenues, tap these other income, loans, grants, o and expenses. General fund transfers and, and um, uh, Travis provides provide more detail on what's incorporated in that. And we have some existing and proposed debt service with the loans we've taken out. We have to pay some debt service on. Uh, and here, uh, the raw water fees, uh, we do collect 14% of the tax fee revenue gets collected into that raw water fund. And we have raw water projects. And um, we have some fee in lieu of water share revenue coming in as well. So, but it's kind of self-contained. It's not really part of what we're looking at in terms of rates. Okay, so uh, other details here, uh, some inflation factors, because we're projecting out 10 years. Our average o is around 4.8%. And we've heard a lot about inflation being high, especially on capital projects and, and probably across the board within the city. Um, it is starting to come down a little bit where uh, some of the forecasts from the Fed show some of the CPI, uh, the regular inflation index is starting to come down. Um, so this is an aggregate. We have to think about what's in our operation and maintenance expenses. We have salaries and wages, we have benefits. Those things will be going up, but there might be other things in the that are not going up that much. Maybe supplies are not going up 4.8%, maybe we're going up 2%. So an aggregate is 4.8% per year. The capital will show 4% on certain projects. Uh, we are working with the, the engineering consultant JVA and they've developed a capital plan and a lot of their um, capital projects do have inflation in it. So, and they've used 4% as their basis. And the reason that might seem low is typically um, when you look at uh, capital project projections, um, there's a lot of contingency things built in because there's a lot of, still a lot of unknowns that might happen in the future. So we don't want to overcorrect and try to provide a, a capital project that's too high, but we also want to recognize that um, there is just normal inflation that occurs. Um, your growth projection is about 21 counts annually. 
And our reserve targets here, this is what is prescribed by the, by the city's reserve documents. Operating reserve 30% of annual operations maintenance expense. So if you had a million dollars in operations maintenance expense, 30% um, would be um, $300,000 if your reserve. Capital reserve is annual, your annual debt service payment. We're setting that away, that away plus $1.6 million. Um, I'm not as familiar with where the $1.6 million came from. I think it, uh, I'm going to speculate on what it is, but it's been in the reserve um, documents for some time. Uh, debt service coverage target is 1.5 times debt service. Um, the required amount from the state that issues loans is 1.1. But you want to maintain a slightly higher debt service coverage in case you do issue loans because you could dip below that 1.1. Uh, any sort of proposed debt, we're going to get an SRF stands for state revolving loan fund, and that's provided by uh, the Colorado Water uh, Water Development Water Resources and Power Development Authority. I get that wrong. They help administer the loans, which come from the EPA, the federal the federal government, and uh, their interest rates are usually better than. Um, what you see uh, for other types of bond instruments, 3.8 percent is what we're assuming in a 20-year term. Very typical, uh, very typical interest rate. The growth projection, the 21 accounts, has that been our trend lately, or same kind of low? The growth projection, um, I think that is an average of what we have for the past five or ten years. Yeah. Which you might have infill, which would also incur pass through the tap fee if there's an incremental change in, you know, so there might be some infill. Travis, Travis, is that those are new taps, not necessarily usually construction. Yeah. Um, so we have two scenarios here we're looking at. One is we're going to cash finance all our projects with the exception of one, which is this kind of grant SRF loan project in 2025. Um, the second one is we have. Uh, some larger projects that instead of trying to cash finance, we're going to assume they're state loans, which helps amortize those costs over a period of time. And one of those projects is a lead service line replacement. Um, you may be familiar with the, the news about lead service lines being, um, you know, being a big issue with residential, or I'm sorry, uh, with, with water utilities and some of the older communities may have lead service lines in them. And so there's a push by the EPA to replace those and uh, using a state revolving loan to help do that helps mitigate large impacts to customers in the future. Plus, it's a, it's a safety concern too. So let's look at <laughs> the 10 year capital improvement program and this in millions of dollars. And you can see that, you know, you can see that it kind of bounces around each year and uh, which makes it a little difficult to kind of have smooth equal adjustments. If everything was the same amount each year, it'd be a lot easier. Let me try to get rid of that. Yeah, I was trying to do that. How is that showing in there? Yeah, that's right. And I got it. Right. That's right. Uh, so you can see that's our capital uh, uh, CIP, as we call it, $52.4 million over the course of 10 years. So a, a healthy capital improvement program. All right, um, so we did some analysis and we determined what kind of revenue adjustments we need. So I'm going to show you a graph here, uh, graphically of our expenditures and revenues and what's happening. So we have our uh, cash funded CIP here. That's the dark or the blue, aqua blue. Um, we have our O&M that we need to fund each year. It does look like the O&M is a different bar length on each of the years just because it's above the CIP. O&M stays pretty consistent. Through the through years. Um, we have a little bit of existing debt service, not much, and it does end in the last couple of years. So those are our expenditures. Our total revenue line with the proposed revenue adjustments, which I'll show you what they are in just a second. Um, that blue line, um, or I'm sorry, that purple line, the goal is to have that purple line be above the bars. That means our revenues are meeting our expenditures, or in the instance where the bars are above the line, our, our expenditures are greater than our revenues. And that means when the bars are above the line in a given year, we're drawing down some of the reserves, some of the money in the bank, because our revenues exceeded our expenditures and we're pulling money from the bank. Uh, in the other year, say 2032, shows that we're kind of building some reserves because our expenditures are below that line. Um, without the revenue adjustments, you've got this yellow line, and you can see that um, it's far below 
the uh, revenue the revenue required. That's based on current rates. Yes, based on current rates. And so we look at our fund balances here, we can see that with the proposed revenue adjustments we have, that 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 amber colored bar or the line rather, that's our target reserve line keeping the bank. You can see there are any balances are staying within that reserve target throughout the study period. They did down just touch that bar a little bit, but we're starting to build our reserves in future years. Now, the good thing is, is that, you know, we're not, it's not growing exponentially, it's growing, but what we're doing again in 2034 is we're setting utility up for the next 10 years. We don't know what's going to happen then, but we know there's probably going to be some major replacements continuing on. So uh, building up some reserves there is 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 typical because we've got our rate increases and that cumulative impact of rate increases is going to build reserves. So here are the annual revenue adjustments here. Now, we'd like to be as smooth as possible, but in this first year, just based on the way the capital is falling, we're looking at a 25% increase in the first year. And that would be applied to the entire rate structure. So if the service charge was a dollar per month and the volume rate was a dollar per thousand gallons, they both go to a dollar twenty-five service charge and a dollar twenty-five per thousand gallons, just across the board. Uh, when we get to the cost of service and rate design, I'll explain how that's a change. Um, so right now, if we were to stop here, stop the study here, your existing rates would just increase across the board based on these revenue adjustments. Um, and then after that first, after 2028 to 2034, the benefit here is that because you have a larger increase up front, you get that benefit of the cum cumulative building of rate increases, so we're able to dial down the rate increases uh, in the future. 25% uh, is um, you know, obviously a difficult number, right? Um, we're seeing along the front range um, uh, up to 40%. I presented in the community about six months ago, two years of 40%. We're just we're seeing double digit elsewhere, and not just in Colorado. Um, so it is all for a myriad of reasons, you know, water rights, <coughs> sorts of things. But um, it's the first time I've seen double digits, and they're getting approved um, because some of these utilities are their backs are, you know, it's just they, they have to do that uh, based on, you know, their capital projects and maintaining the system. So um, the city's not summarizing that. Uh, let's look at scenario number two. We have the same capital program, but now we've got two colors. The amber color there is those project costs that will be debt financed over the study period. So um, what we're basically doing is taking the sum of those projects, which are state loans of $31.6 million, and we're going to amortize that cost over 20 years. So instead of having to pay the full cash amount each year for those projects, we're going to pay a a debt service payment just like you do with, with your car if you decide to finance that. Uh, and so that helps mitigate the the large revenue adjustment swing that we might have, or even what we saw there in the scenario. Um, a thing about debt, obviously there is a risk associated with debt. You are taking on interest, which makes the project cost more. But we are taking on a loan for a particular piece of infrastructure that's going to last well beyond 20 years. So we're not taking out a 20-year loan for something that's going to last five years. So that's that's one thing that's important to know. Um, that will certainly provide a lot of service and benefit to customers uh, over much more than 20 years. So we look at this here, you know, similar look. Um, the the purple line here is a little, you know, shifted down a little bit, but you can see that we are building reserves in in more years here. That 2034. Um, we are we are building uh, building some more reserves as well. We've eased the burden on um, on the rate increase itself, um, and our reserves here we're staying well within our reserves, so we're meeting those targets. And in both of these, we're meeting our debt service coverage ratios. In, in both of these. So if we look at our rate increases, we're going to do a six percent across the board for the ten year period. So that smooths things out. We are paying more of the interest because we're issuing debt, but uh, considering where interest rates are today and the 3.8% uh, for a 20 year loan for infrastructure is going to last quite a long time, uh, it's, uh, it's a favorable option to look at. So we have those two scenarios with 25 and the 15s and going down to 5, holding up to 6%. So you can see the dynamics behind 
issuing debt. The other dynamic which we haven't explored here is if you know projects are moved around that can have an impact on rate increases as well. But here we want to keep the capital improvement programs the same um, to be able to do more of an apples to apples comparison. So our scenario here, uh, scenario one, the the um, uh, the increases are twenty five percent in two thousand twenty five followed by 15% for two years and then 5%. Um, we're cash financing all of the projects except for one grant project for $5 million. Uh, we're getting a loan for that in 2025. Uh, we're meeting our target reserves, meeting our debt service coverage. And um, scenario two, equal annual increases of 6% from 25 to 2034. And here we're funding LSLR means lead service line replacement. And that's for lead service lines. Um, and every utility is having to go through that. It's just not a Canyon City thing. Um, it's Denver water. Um, even if they have very few, they have to go around and figure it out. If they can find out whether they've got it, they got to dig and test. Um, we're meeting our target reserves and our debt service coverage on both existing and proposed debt. So it's two ways to get to the same end. So the question becomes um, the level of capital improvements and how you want to fund those and the impacts to, to customers. Here's a quick survey here. Um, third from the bottom is Canyon City, but this is a typical bill. I think it's 10,000 gallons a month for a three quarter inch meter. Most customers have a three quarter inch meter. Um, and we're, you know, we're third from the, from the bottom, but this is all one data point. Every utility is different in terms of how much the water rights cost. Do they use surface water? Do they use wells? All these use surface water, I meaning they have a treatment plant. Um, the density of customers, you know, how many how many miles of distribution names for do they have per customer? So many things make a difference, but this is a, a common and important um, uh, comparison piece that um, stakeholders like to look at. It kind of boils everything down, but you do have to keep those things in in, um, in consideration that there's just, there's so many that every utility is different. Um, now these are all 2024 typical bills. Um, when we come back to you with a proposed rate, um, it might go up on the scale here, but we're still comparing the 2024 to our peers. We don't know what they're going to do. We usually, you know, they may not be able to divulge what the 2025 increase is, especially they're not product to council, so we don't know. So, despite the fact that it might move up, we don't know what these other communities might be doing. Finally, this is a TAP fee um, comparison, and the same thing with TAP fees in terms of. Uh, uh, the difference is, you know, some communities are growing very quickly and they just have a whole host of other things we need to incorporate in tap fees. Um, we are in third at the bottom here and it increases for the other communities. You know, Pueblo West, I believe, is, is a growing community and so they have relatively more newer facilities that need to be able to expand. So, hence, that might be a reason why they're a little higher. I'm not quite sure, but again, using this as one data point, that might be an example of, of a higher growth community. So <laughs> Um, so, uh, just because um, Canyon City is on, on the lower end doesn't mean that, um, you know, that's a bad or, or good thing. It's just different compared to the other, other utilities. Um, the, the city is obviously maintaining a good level of service today, which is good. And um, the goal is with our financial plan increases or the projections that the uh, city will be able to maintain that level of service going forward for uh, its existing and customers. So our next steps are, we need to finalize the cash flow scenarios. We need to dial those in. Obviously feedback here will be important and any other sort of discussions internally will help us dial those in. Any sort of changes from the JVA engineering consultant and make those changes. Um, we have this cost of service analysis and rate design, which will help us make sure that we're getting uh, our costs are covered equitably or proportionately between residential, commercial, and any other customer classes. The rate design will make sure that we've uh, designed a structure that we can recover the cost from each customer based on uh, what's important to the community in terms of affordability, conservation, um, equity between low and high volume users, and that sort of thing. Uh, look at the thing again to the zone charges, making sure that we're charging the zone zone charges to the zone related customers, not to the other retail customers. When you finalize the tap fee analysis, um, we've, we've done a uh, pretty good look at that. We have a couple of little things we just want to check the boxes on to make sure that we've got a, a good number for that. Um, that should impact our financial plan scenarios because there's not much tap fee revenue coming in each year, but we want to check the box and the final stamp on that. 
panels that we have like this. We have a council, some stakeholder presentations and reports to come back to. Um, I'll share some of the screen here. Council's next. Council. Council's next. Yeah. Um, and uh, that will wrap up our study uh, for for the city. So uh, a lot of information, um, a lot of detail. It, it you know seems easy to me, but I live in this stuff, and I, you know there's probably a lot of questions with it. So we more than happy to dive into some of the details here, and answer some questions about wasn't clear on some of the topics. Yeah. One more. Just kind of uh, summarize again the differences between scenario one and two. And I mean, some of it with loans, and then how the percentages change. Got it. Okay. It's really so, are there any other scenarios that we consider? We've not looked at any. Um, these are kind of the first two. These are the first two we'd always start with is cash financing versus identifying others for loan financing. Some other scenarios might be if projects got moved. Or uh, some projects uh, got removed from the CIP, or we want to use a different funding instrument that we assume there'd be a lot of grants coming in or something. But the, everything else will probably be a variant of these two. These are kind of the two stuff. You looked at 20 year loans, uh, however, this is a 10 year period. Right. So, um, thinking out into the future, how, if, if we're taking on debt, what does that look like for years 11 through 20? And how, how will how does that affect future projections? Well, obviously, it's, it's an obligation that you need to have, but we try and build some reserves in the next 10 year period. Um, the, the debt that's being issued here, in terms of the percentage of the overall cost, is not um, super substantial. So, it probably be easier to mitigate. And if you do have enough you know, reserves built, you can also pay those loans off. So, or refinance. Travis, do, do those loans have any forgiveness uh, opportunities as part of them? Yeah, so we'd actually be chasing a $6 million loan. There's a $1 million loan forgiveness for the water main replacement, another one that we're going to be applying for in January. So that's why, you know, the $5 million. So we're actually getting $6 million from the state with a $1 million loan forgiveness. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> those terms kind of changed on us. Um, we were going to go for more. Because they were uh, the state was offering a 50% loan forgiveness up to five million. Um, but the funding changed for them. And so they dropped it down to 50% up to one million. So we had we had to kind of uh, change our scope from what we wanted for that main replacement loan. And and uh, this is what we came up with. Todd, maybe for the next presentation, if you could add a slide that shows. Uh, through the years, the total debt, not you know, just not just debt service, but the total debt that, that, that would be incurred in the, 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 the total annual debt. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be in our in our. We, we would show that here. Of you know, here's the existing annual debt service and in, in, in the partner, so you can see it going up as as we issue more debt. It, Bar well, I, I understand that. But I'm, I would like to see the absolute value of the total debt okay. as, as a slide in the next presentation. Okay. If you could, please. yeah. Travis, yeah, going back to the lip service line replacement, that $25 million number always has an opportunity to go down to more than we have. Yeah, that is the most conservative number that we came up with as we're going through our service line identification process. Um, we are a little more than halfway through that. We have about 30, 3,100 um, service lines left to, to identify. And so that is, yeah, again, that's a very conservative, assuming we we'll are be replacing a lot of those service lines, which we most likely will not be doing. But for purposes of this, we wanted to go conservative and make sure we had enough to do what we needed to do in the event it was a lot of service lines. So we'll be, uh, we'll be look, taking a look see at the rest of those service lines, hopefully get them all, all identified next year have a really good idea of what we're looking at as far as service line replacement. Um, there's a couple of categories of what we have to do. It's not just lead lines. Uh, we don't we don't feel or we haven't uh, we haven't seen through our current outreach efforts many lead service lines, but there's a whole other category galvanized need to be replaced and that's what we're seeing a lot of uh, in our system is just the old galvanized lines that we're going to be needing to you know, replace. So that's what you guys say 
back in the day they used lead solder, right? Yeah, I mean there's there's uh, there's lead solder on there. Um, and there's there are studies shown that if, if galvanized was ever downstream of any of any lead, uh, galvanized could could in essence hold on to that lead. Yeah. Uh, and so that that's why they're they're calling galvanized need to be replaced in this lead production effort. That was, was there one slide that, that had like two options for possible rate increases, water rate increases, where six percent straight across all the years, or higher when and then two lower ones. Yep. So the scenario one was the higher, higher initial water rate because we'd be cash financing all of those capital improvement projects. So the the lead line replacement being the, the high value one, we'd be cash financing all that via rates coming in. Scenario two would be going after that low. And so that uh, that debt service would be stretched out over 20 years. So so the 6% that would be suggested increases to the customers. Correct. Every year. Okay. Yeah. I, Every year for two. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, um, I think I just think that a 25% rate increase would right now with everything else we're going through, I think that's just a road, just a road too far. If if you know Black Hills gets what they, what they want, that 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 would be catastrophic for our families. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why, you know, we we don't like taking on debt, right? I mean it's not, I mean, not we don't have a choice. But, but in some we spread instances out it's, it's rate increases. You know, it makes sense to do. Yeah. And I think that this and you know this is a nice way of having data to back up why we think taking on debt is, is a good idea in this in this instant instance because if we don't in order to do what we need to do that's a lot of money you know to to our rate payers and so we're kind of trying to show that we're we're doing due diligence to to make sure that our rate payers don't get hit with high rate increases if all possible if we, if we can manage it with Maintaining our reserves and you know, at, towards the end of that period, the, the tenure period, build a, a fund reserve uh, for future projects where that, that's the most fiscally responsible thing that we need to do in the future share of Do you have options for grants? You didn't show any grants, but they're, they're unfortunately they're for lead line replacements right now, there are no grants. We are definitely keeping our ear to the, to the ground, so to speak, and seeing what comes down the pipeline. But for the uh, federally funded infrastructure acts, it's all coming through as these loans right now. As all loans. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they the just water, released the, the phase two of that infrastructure funding, and it, it, it is all loans to be funded. I think at uh, I think it's fifty percent of the total project cost. So we're, we're definitely keeping our eye on on those opportunities. So the water rate increases, or the water rate, is that renewed or revisited annually every year? So this, if it comes up way up like 25% and then it were, say, flush with money, can you bring it back down? I mean, are those in increases must go through city council they do. annually, right? So, yeah, so this, this rate study wouldn't be performed every year uh, if that's what you're asking. But the opportunity to look at whether you know, we've had more than expected uh, income due to just, you know, people using more water, for example. You know, I think that that can be looked at internally and, and uh, reevaluated every year. And the other side of that coin, coin is, uh, you know, higher than anticipated costs, you know, spike on the lead line or something like that. So yeah. that works in, that's both sides, but essentially yeah. city council reviews it every year and gets, gets the, a great pleasure of voting on how much yeah we we try to budget our revenue on the low side um just, just kind of for that reason you know we want to we want to assume a, a drop year you know or uh sorry the other way we want to assume a rainy year where maybe people aren't using as much water uh, so our revenue would be lower um unfortunately in this business we do, do just have that risk we don't know from year to year, we don't have a locked in revenue amount. We have a general idea of what we're getting. It could be a rainy year, it could be a drought year. You know, we don't we don't know the answer to that. So we do try to conservatively budget our revenue. So Travis, isn't it fair to say too that there's a sensitivity there for the customer where you know people just start watering less, not because of 
screen, but because the budget is there, all the budget doesn't allow for it. So there's, you know, you see, and I've had people complain my, about that. One my concern. There's more places around town where people just, you know, for, for weeks. They're turned off to outside water. Mm -hmm. and, and for the right. I'm sure it's being yeah, that's right. And like with the lead line replacement, just to make sure that you know once that goes through, that it's up to the homeowner to replace their own service line from the meter or their property line into the house. This would be us replacing the whole the service line to foundation. That's everything. And then this so there would be no cost incurred on the homeowner themselves. Not unless they have some internal to their house. Okay. But in, inside the foundation, that's up to the homeowner from the foundation or service line in. That's up to theirs. But the rest of it, even on the property line, inside their property line, that is going to be part of this. So. Unfortunately, it, it, this is a change. You know, we've, we've never been responsible after the meter. And because of this mandate, we, we have to take that responsibility. Because that's where it kind of changed all of a sudden. Yeah, this is a big, big, big difference in how we operate. Yeah, and that's even like when they do locate, you know, for water, they only want to locate up to the property line yeah. or the curb. And that will continue. I mean, not to get off in the weeds or anything like that, but we don't own the service line from property line to foundation. That is, that is the homeowner's. They own that, so we're not going to locate that. But you know, due to these new rules, we may be responsible for replacing it if it falls into those couple categories of material. And the lead line replacement is going to be that was due, it has to be all by 2020 2037. 20, 30, 30, uh, but that rule has not been finalized, it's been changed that's a few times. Like, it's so far out and. It's governmental, so we know how that changes <laughs> crazily. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the rules under review again right now. They're expecting that this newest iteration is going to pass. This newest iteration gives you 10 years to replace all those categories of materials starting in 2027, 10 years. So this line replacement will be to the city. You guys internally will be the ones doing the work on replacing. Oh, no, that's so know. that is not figured out. I mean, those are details. Really, those are you know that's yeah. we know a general cost for replacement, and that's what we're going for an average cost of replacement uh, of a service line, and that's what we're using right now. But how the work is going to get performed is not that's years away yet. Whether that's a contractor or otherwise. We assume it will be. Uh, people want to see Chris working on private property, but you know, again, now liabilities. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. For, for comparison with the sanitation district, sanitation district's been doing a five percent increase every year for the last six to eight years to build up our capital reserves because we're going to have to replace our treatment plant that's forty years old. So, and we anticipate at some point we'll probably have. Right now, the sanitation district's debt free, but we'll probably have to do like you and take when we actually have to do major replacements at the treatment plant. We'll probably have to do some loans just like you guys are sure. anticipating. And did you guys just do a pretty significant tap fee increase? Now, tap fees increased from 2500 to 4500 yeah, depending on what kind of sure. tree for an average yeah. house. But in comparison with the other entities, many of those towns that you guys put up there, they're similar size. We're we're sewer, we're at the bottom two, and, and many guys for the bottom one. And for tap fees, we we're at the bottom. So our tap fees were way below everybody else, but our, our rates are in the bottom two or three, just like you have for water, comparing to Trinidad and security and Pueblo West and those same entities. I did like your 30,000 foot look. Yeah. I, I like that because it shows that you're very comprehensive in all the. I'd like to have your card. <laughs> I think I actually have yeah. some new ones. <laughs> so, anyway, the, the 6% seems reasonable from what we're seeing at the sanitation district. Uh, I am concerned about water rates going up and more homes looking like 
<laughs> it's a desert, or you know, because they can't afford water, but they also can't afford the zero escaping. So it, I think that makes our community less economically attractive for new businesses and such. So that's <laughs> something that bothers me. But I, it sounds like the six percent is kind of tracking what we're, what we're doing at the sanitation district. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll be hard, on. Got to run. Our big unknown is the the state is looking at and FAP EPA is looking at changing what's allowable for us to put back into this river, especially in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus. And if they lower those acceptable rates, we will have to we'll be a major. <laughs> we have to add whole new processes. Like Big treatment we're talking change. twenty or thirty million dollars process. There's a lot of folks seeing that I mean that's incremental change there but the cost is from look at that. Right. I think it's always a scary thing when it comes to treat treating water or wastewater is you never know what's what's next on the EPA's <laughs> mind, you know, and if it's something that affects you, well that's that's really hard to forecast, you know. Well we well, they've been they're supposed to have had a new permit five years ago, but they're behind and, I know and that. all the Sanitation district entities are kind of have our consortium and we're lobbying the other way that, that we have to do this more incrementally. We can't afford uh, well, we're in a we're in a great position too. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, PFAs, PFOAs mm -hmm. that are a big big ticket item right now in the water treatment world and all of our, our sampling that we've had, we've had non detects. So that's that's uh, that's really nice yeah, because that, that treatment for for getting the PFAs out of your water is is pretty highly technical. Crazy. It is crazy. I mean, you're talking parts per trillion. Yeah. I mean, it's one part per trillion. Yeah, one part per trillion. <laughs> to get that, I mean, it's just the treatment is is crazy. We had to add on to uh, our treatment plan. So very happy that we that we don't have to pay attention to yeah. that too much with respect to our testing and, and security or something. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They were kind of ground zero for all that. Is CDPH in your regulator? Um, yes. We, we have a couple different entities, <laughs> but there's one of them. And we have, and the state has regulation too. And, Right now, we're at EPA or exceeding, depending on which new crunch you're looking at. So, we have some, some ability to play with that a little bit. Anyway, so I, I think 6% is kind of in line with what we're planning at the sewer end of things. And what we're seeing similar kind of cost and replacement in the sewer district just. <laughs> I mean, we, we monitor all lines every five years and we replace, we've got almost all the old play lines, except for in Florence, we still have some, but those have almost all been replaced and our infrastructure in the distribution system is a pretty dang good job. So sanitation, sanitation costs is not, is it related to water usage or is that just storm water? Well, the, the fees we charge, there is a size of a tap that you have for your, sentence, your sewer, and then you pay a rate based on the size. So, commercial business or you know, prisons, of course, are one of our customers. <laughs> There's a whole broad range of but residential, but it doesn't depend. They look at people's flow in January, what they because they don't want to look at their flows during the irrigation season. But they do look at January flows, but they mostly pay based on the size of a pipe coming out of your home. So right now, don't we don't meter it and we can't shut it off. <laughs> I think they do use a water tap to some degree, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and we have three months. Sanitation district. Now that doesn't say that follow the same lines as the water district because it's King City Water District and right. not two different entities. Two different entities in a bigger county. Yeah. 
So the um, sanitation district is just that. It's a, it's a bit there on their own special district. Runs from Burn Burn Park 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 treatment plant to the college out here and then a lot of places in between. We're seeing annual growth more, quite a bit higher than 21, but then people already have water and then they choose to connect to the sewer district. Sure. And also our areas you know, include a lot of folks that are on their own wells, things like that. But yeah, our, our annual taps are you know, several times 21. It varies depending on what's going on, but it would be 60 to 100. I suppose over the last few years. Yeah, you also incorporate Florence. So. Right, yeah, we include Florence and we include a lot of the rural areas in between. Okay, uh, other questions for Todd or comments? Uh, well, the, the city council members present will get to see this again. Yes, so that would be uh, uh, really part of November if I remember it more fine tuning. Yes. Yeah. So we'll just continue continue our work. Uh, these next steps will be completed, and uh, we'll have a more finalized draft for the general government meeting. So that's open to anybody too. We sure. It's general public government. Yeah. And what was that date? The general government meeting. I'd have to double check, but I could. Uh, In November. Yeah, I'm almost sure it was. Could be the first Wednesday or second. November sixth. That sounds correct. What day of the week is that? Like 6 p.m. November 6th. At 6 p.m.? Yeah. Yeah, so that will be the next time that the water rate study will be presented and that'll also be council's time to uh, talk about the water rate increase for 2025. And then of course the ordinance will be heard twice by city council in December. Which we can set. A lot more time for public meetings. Yeah. Okay. If people online, I don't know if everybody online has any. So this rate study was also determined partly by the numbers we looked at from JRD or whatever with that JBA. JBA. So those numbers from them were also right. put into this with the rate study. Right. Uh, Increases what they recommended for improvements and all that. Cool. It's based on their suggested capital plan. Yeah, so that's all the special projects that we have coming up. Um, they provided a 20 year capital improvement plan, which is going to change over the next 20 years, but as we see it, short, medium, and long range projects. And so, this is based on the capital improvement plan that JBA has generated for us, as well as anticipated rising costs and OM operation and maintenance budgets. So, uh, uh, it's going back to the debt that we looking at scenario two you're specifically looking at the five million for the water line replacement and 25 million for the service line that we're at that's correct that's the two debt that we're looking at right now yeah so there's opportunities you know, so that's a cool one yeah but that's the two that we looked at for this obviously so we'd be cash funding at all the other capital Okay, if there's uh, no other questions or comments, thank you, Todd, for being here and thank you for presenting for us. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And with that, I think we're adjourned.